Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. This is the very first time that I've, uh, that I've delivered this talk, but it's a talk that I've been wanting to give for a long time. Um, Harry Frankfurt's book on bullshit is, is a philosophical work near and dear to my heart, and I nearly froze to death to see Harry Frankfurt appear on The Daily Show to talk about it when it was reissued in uh, 2005. So I am just thrilled to be here to share this with you. The talk is called On Bullshit. Harry Frankfurt, Donald Trump, and indifference to truth. And this is the book that started it all. So it's, uh, it's called On Bullshit, and it's by a philosopher called Harry Frankfurt, who is currently an emeritus professor at Princeton in philosophy. It was originally published in the Raritan Quarterly Review in 1986, and then in what I think is an act of publishing genius, Princeton University Press reissued it in 2005 in um, this nice format that you see here that could be both an academic library book and a bathroom book. <laughs> and uh, the, the book came out at a time when the nation was acutely in need of some kind of intellectual guidance on, on the subject of bullshit as an academic inquiry. It was republished in 2005 in the wake of the invasion of Iraq, the weapons of mass destruction scandal, the re-election of George Bush. Uh, in the intervening years, if you go to Google, you can see that the PDF version has been cited 661 times in disciplines ranging from philosophy to psychology to education to marketing. And um, it kind of was launched as a popular concern. Uh, John Stewart, when it came out, recognized that this was something that America really, really needed to hear about and had Frankfurt on The Daily Show. He really, as a host, Stewart really had his finger on the pulse about this sort of devaluation of truth. And when I found out that uh, Harry Frankfurt was going to be on The Daily Show, I was extremely excited. And it turned out that my best friend and near identical twin from graduate school uh, was coming to town. So I waited in line for six hours in the freezing wind to finally get in. And we got, it. We got to the front of the line, and we were told that the last seat was gone. And uh, the ex executive producer came to the door, and the look on her face when she saw me was truly disconcerting. I w later went to the bathroom and realized that was because my lips were bright blue. I, I thought that was some kind of metaphor or something, but no, this was like, this is like sky blue, not even blueberry blue. <laughs> and they, they didn't want to turn us away, so they let us go upstairs to uh, watch the show in the crow's nest with the engineer named Rocky. So it was a very, it was a very special experience. And you can probably still get video of uh, Frankfurt's appearance on The Daily Show, which I highly recommend that you look up. It was a really entertaining interview. So defining the concept of bullshit, we, and as Frankfurt points out, we know that there's a lot of it. We think we know how to spot it, and yet we struggle to define it. And there, bullshit's a really popular slang term, and this is always the case when you start with ordinary language and philosophy that you know, it's, it's not surprising that there are going to be many different senses of the same word. And it's not a contest as to which one is right or wrong. It's a matter, it's a challenge to observe how people actually use these different forms of language and analyze in which the ways it's, it, the concept is used and to try and pick the concept that's most illuminating for whatever subject or analysis that you want to undertake using the concept. And I, I really like Frankfurt's concept because I think it's extremely illuminating for understanding our current political moment, the media, and the culture of celebrity. But there are other equally valid non-Frankfurtian senses of the word bullshit, and I'm just going to quickly go over some of them um, just to kind of orient you and talk about them. So one, one idea is that bullshit is something false, implausible, or discredited. For instance, an, an example would be astrology is bullshit. Something that's unconvincing, a second sense of bullshit. I'm sick of your bullshit excuses. I don't care if your uncle died. A and it may be true that your uncle died, but the essence of this usage is that it's either irrelevant or unpersuasive, possibly connoting that it was offered somehow in bad faith, too, like that we both know it's not relevant that your uncle died as to whether you have to pay your taxes. Or something, then a third sense, non-Frankfurtian sense, is something that's contrived, faked, or rationalized. The police officer said he smelled marijuana, but that was bullshit. And that could mean either it was untrue, or it could mean it was true, but it wasn't the real reason that the police officer searched the car, or that even if it was the reason, it wasn't a good enough reason. So this is Frankfurtian, we come now to Frankfurtian bullshit. 
And the essence of Frankfurtian bullshit is really interesting. It's an idea that you know, some ideas you feel, you put them on and they're like a perfect pair of jeans. They just instantly fit and you felt like you've owned it forever. They solve all your problems. And the idea of bullshit as indifference to truth was just one of those ideas. It just felt like I'd always known it when I read it because it's, it explains so much. And what it both basically comes down to is the bullshitter's goal is to present himself in a certain light. Philosophers tend to assume that the point of conversation is just swapping prepositions back and forth, relaying truth, conveying information. And what social scientists and human, be and gen human beings in general know is that truth is not always the goal of conversation. And the, the goal of bullshitting as a conversational activity is to present oneself in a certain light, to make people believe certain attributes about the speaker rather than anything about the, the world as it is. The aim is manipulation, and therefore the standard is efficacy rather than accuracy. And a, an essential, the essential element. Now, bullshit can be, on the Frankfurtian model, true, false, or nonsense. But the essence of it is that the bullshitter must conceal the fact that he's bullshitting. That it's a fundamentally deceptive enterprise, because if somebody, if somebody admitted their purpose, it would have no persuasive power and no efficacy. So it, and I made this meme with an actual picture of Harry Frankfurt that I found on the web. It kind of captures it. However studiously and conscientiously the bullshitter proceeds, he's trying to get away with something. And there's the man himself in his best Jamie Lannister pose. Now, Frankfurt draws a sharp distinction between lies versus bullshit. And he points out that a liar is at least concerned with the truth. In fact, it's conceptually impossible to lie unless you believe you know the truth. Because what is lying but understanding or believing the world to be one way and stating that it's another? And as a practical matter, believable lies must stick close to the truth. If you're going to tell a lie, you want to make sure you, inter you know what fa the other facts are and interweave as many of the true facts as possible into your account to heighten the plausibility of whatever false fact you're going to want to slip in there. Frankfurt talks in his essay about the craft of lying versus the art of bullshit. And what he means there is the idea is that you really do have to make a kind of surgical strike on the truth if you're going to lie, whereas with bullshit, it's just sort of truth adjacent, and the speaker is not really interested in what the facts are in the world at all. And of course, lying, re lying requires that you believe something and state the thing, something opposite, whereas bullshit doesn't require that the bullshitter believe anything in particular. Problems with Frankfurt's view. The, the biggest problem here, the biggest logical tension in the whole enterprise is that lying and bullshitting frequently go together. And the tension is, well, if bullshit is truly, is, is indifference to truth, why is someone indifferent to truth using lies? Because remember, Frankfurt's bullshit can be true, false, or nonsensical. And it would be really strange, to, uh, one way to sort of, one argumentative strategy to save it is to say, well, bullshit is then things that are true or nonsensical and lying is the category for false stuff, but then that puts you in the weird and uncomfortable position of saying that you know, bullshit is categorically true-ish, which seems to be the opposite of what we tried to establish when we investigated the concept of bullshit in the first place, and definitely not a position that Franklin is committed to. So that, that's a logical tension in Franklin's view that I'm not entirely sure how to resolve. But um, it doesn't make the, I don't think it makes the construct any less useful for analyzing uh, the subject of tonight's presentation, who's Donald Trump, who is both a habitual liar and an egregious bullshitter. One interesting moral dilemma that Frankfurt um, throws out in the piece, and he says he leaves it as, the, as an exercise to the reader, is why we think that bullshitting is generally less morally culpable than lying. We're generally willing to give bullshitters a pass, whereas we think that lying is a sin. I mean, it's right there in the Ten Commandments. It's you know, written throughout our society that, we should, that you know, it's one of the first moral things that we tell children. We have no particular instruction at all for whether children should, how children should regard bullshitting. But, and, but Frankfurt really believes that bullshit is more nefarious than lies because he thinks that it fosters a, contempt of, a climate of contempt for the truth. That bullshitters are dangerous and unsettling because they don't even acknowledge the importance of being right. And I, I sort of feel like, I, if you're like me, I, I think you can probably really relate to it. It's that er, er, kind of moment where the absolute frustration of someone who just doesn't believe that the truth is important. And another question that Frankfurt poses in the essay is, why is there so much bullshit? He acknowledges that it's impossible to say categorically that there's more today than there was at some point in the past. But on the other hand, 
there, there certainly do, things, do seem to be things that are contributing to the efflorescence of bullshit in our current moment. Maybe there were other things in the past that sustained high levels of bullshit, but the things that are sustaining high levels of bullshit in the current moment seem to be things like, um, and this is Frankfurt's classic one, people forced to opine about things that they don't know anything about. It seems to be just sort of a general, eternal, very uh, conducive condition for making people bullshit. That, that for, I mean, for one thing, for talking about something you don't know something about, that you must have ulterior motives for talking about it in the first place. Like, whatever you're getting out of that conversation is not, it's not edifying other people. It is somehow, you know, establishing something about their perception of you. Another thing that Frankfurt doesn't talk about, but I think, is that the structure of political campaigns is basically the personification of Frankfurtian bullshit. Because you have people, the point of campaigning is really, dark. I mean, we don't look to our political candidates as expositors of truth. They're not at the cutting conceptual edge of how we should solve our problems, really. I mean, I'm not saying, oh, politicians are dumb. That's not, what I'm, that's not the point that I'm trying to make here. Some are and some aren't. But it's the point of campaigning, getting up and espousing certain positions and convincing people of certain facts about you and whether you would be a good person to be in power, to be in charge, to make decisions. Sort of laying out what you want to do and then also trying to convince people that you are the right sort of person to be making those kinds of calls in the first place. And that is just a recipe for Frankfurtian bullshit because it, it takes away from the truth, really. That it's, it's, much, it's a, as much a performance about the individual as it is about the subjects under discussion. So that's just automatically a ripe and kind of unavoidable source of bullshit in our, our public discourse. And another thing that's uh, really important is the 24-hour news cycle, that all of a sudden this time has been, bullshit has been monetized through the time in the news cycle, that there's 24 hours of time to fill, all of which can sell ads, and it's a really tough call for any media staff to think of 24 hours worth of true and relevant things to say. I mean, very, very, few, very few media uh, you know, organizations rise to the task on any given part of any day, let alone a whole 24-hour cycle, let alone everyone doing it every day. Frankfurt suggests, and I tend to believe too, that uh, relativism and non, sort of non-naturalistic worldviews tend to, uh, tend to you know, expand, our, expand our tolerance for bullshit. Um, I mean, he doesn't really argue for it at length. I mean, it just sort of seems like a commonsensical position, but also it sort of seems as if, my, my feeling is that maybe relativism doesn't so much expand our tolerance for Frank, it doesn't cause Frankfurtian bullshit so much as expand our tolerance for other people's bullshit. That if we're not really clear and adamant in the, tr the truth is ourselves, we're not going to go around calling people and insisting that they live up to truthful standards. And this one is not one that, Franklin, that Frankfurt talks about, but one that I really believe is true, is bullshit as tribalism. That, you, that there are a lot of political claims floating around right now that people seem to make, not so much because they believe it's true, but because it establishes them as playing for a certain team. For instance, not, uh, birtherism is a perfect example of this. Like the idea that President Barack Obama is a Kenyan Muslim, it's it's so it's it's not it's not an opinion. I mean, obviously, if you want to say, if you want to be on the Democratic team, you'll say I'm pro-choice, or if you want to be a Republican, like, I'm anti-gun. It's not a value statement. It's a factual statement, but it's so far off from consensual reality that by affirming it, you're essentially identifying yourself as a member of a subculture. That it's it's sort of meta bullshit because both are you you know asserting something that's false, you know, assert, and you're you're inviting people to view you in a certain way, irrespective of the truth the truth value of what you're saying. And Franklin closes the essay by arguing that sincerity is bullshit. And this is his cautionary note to the reader because he sees that people might want to take the kind of logical, uh, the kind of logical step to combating bullshit by saying that you know, what, we, what really counts is sincerity, that we should judge people by how, how heartfelt their statements are, how much they mean what they say or seem to mean what they say. And Franklin thinks that's a dead end because, first of all, intent to deceive isn't the central problem of bullshit because bullshitters are indifferent to the truth. And the other problem is we, it's really difficult to know whether somebody's sincere. We don't, real, we don't have direct access to people's mental states. We can only infer what their motives are from their behavior. And really the problem is not, the problem if you want more respect for truth is you want more truth. 
And it doesn't really matter how the individual feels. What matters is whether or not they've done the intellectual work to get things right most of the time, or to revise and reassert if they get things wrong. That it's, he feels that it's just fundamentally a dead end to start policing people's sincerity and their intentions, rather than simply looking and paying attention to their claims and evaluating them and seeing if they regularly seem to be in line with the truth. Which brings us now to Donald J. Trump, GOP frontrunner, heir to a New York real estate fortune, developer and casino owner, NBC reality star, and owner of the billion dollar Trump brand. Trump claims his net worth is $10 billion, compared to Forbes 4.5 or Bloomberg's 2.9, you know, that's a few billion among friends. Uh, four of his companies have declared bankruptcy. One of the most recent one, I think, um, owed $1.8 billion at the end he walked away from. And Trump is really interesting because he's achieved this kind of post-factual wealth. That in the old days, he was a kind of traditional developer, that he would actually put together deals to build buildings that people would then buy and he would make money. But nowadays, mostly what he does is he sells the Trump brand. He puts the logo the Trump logo on all kinds of other people's buildings, or on socks, or on any number of other different products. And one of the reasons that his net worth fluctuates so dramatically, depending on who's estimating it, is because by Trump's own admission, a huge percent of his net worth is his, his subjective valuation of his brand. He actually testified in court that you know, his net worth fluctuates based on his mood, day by day. Because sometimes he thinks Trump is, Trump is awesome, and sometimes it's merely amazing, you know? That's how it goes. Telling it like it is. And like I said earlier, political campaigning is kind of the epitome of Frankfurtian bullshit. And we have a lot of barriers to, to actual honest political conversation even beyond that in our society, that we've got a widespread erosion of trust money, special interests, people don't really feel like they're politicians or serving the interests of ordinary people or speaking to them honestly about their concerns. And so voters crave, in, crave apparent sincerity. But there's a paradox there because then you've got people like Donald Trump who've become very adept at, at signaling sincerity, i.e. bullshitting, that they have a lot of rhetorical tics and styles that make you think that they're a very sincere person, irrespective of the actual content of what they're saying, which is kind of classic bullshit. And this, this brings us to kind of the, the paradox of Trump's support, which is that his, his supporters insist that they like him because he's authentic. And if you're inclined to be critical of Trump, you'd say, well, what they're really saying is that he's unscripted, casually racist, and crass. But uh, people, people are picking up on that as being, you know, they, they view him as being really sincere. And yet, uh, Trump's own campaign manager this week told the RNC that his campaign Romina is, demeanor is just a persona that he intends to shed for the next phase of the campaign. Trump has a, a complicated, actually he has a very simple relationship to the truth, which is contempt. And there's a, a taxonomy of Trump, of, of Trump truth. So you've got your out and out lies, things that are false that he almost certainly knows are false. You've got your egregious inaccuracies, things that are false, but it's unclear whether he knows or not. And, and then he's got you know, the true indifference to the truth, the pure Frankfurtian bullshit, which is exemplarized, exemplified by uh, the border wall and, and uh, his flirtation with birtherism. So let's, let's do a brief tour of Trump lies, just, just fun here. So we've got, you know, watching Muslims, he claimed that he watched Muslims dance on the street on 9-11 when it was pointed out that he was nowhere near Jersey City where these Muslims were purportedly dancing. He walked that back to, he watched it on television, but the footage doesn't exist. But he, he continues to maintain that, yes, he did see the footage on 9-11, though there's no record of it anywhere. Um, he loves to claim that he never sells lawsuits, though he has settled lawsuits many times. It's a matter of public record. Uh, he's lied about owning a winery, Trump Wines, which says on its website that they have no connection to Donald Trump. Um, he's lied about whether he's pledged legal fees to his violent supporters who beat up protesters. He said at rallies, literally on tape, there's video of him saying, I go ahead, knock the crap out of this protester, I'll pay your legal fees, I promise. And then when protesters actually have gone ahead and been violent, he's been called on that and has said, yes, I'm look we're looking into paying this guy's legal fees. When he was called on that, this was the 
specifically I'm thinking of the protester in North Carolina who sucker punched the guy. And then he later denied having done that. And it's, it's really interesting to watch a video of Donald Trump getting caught in a lie. It was beyond my technical skills to put the video clips in in time. But he's just completely unfazed. It just doesn't really seem to bother him. He lies with such, he just you know, flatly denies that he ever said anything of the type. Um, Mich the, the case of Michelle Fields, that was the former Breitbart reporter who was tackled on video by uh, Trump's campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski. Um, Trump claimed that she changed her story when, uh, when it was revealed that there was security footage. She never actually changed her story. Um, Sh Cherry Jacobus, who's a Republican PR consultant, uh, filed a defamation suit this week on the grounds that uh, Trump, she criticized Trump and then Trump went on Twitter and said that she begged for a job with the campaign and become hostile against Jacobus when she was denied the, camp the campaign job. Jacobus produced evidence that, uh, in fact, it was the Trump campaign that had courted her for a job and she turned down the job. But uh, it, was, it ended up being incredibly damaging because as soon as Trump went after her on Twitter, she was subject to days of misogynistic violence from the uh, from his uh, Twitter supporters. And then there was, then this is sort of a strange pattern of Trump lying about weird things for almost no reason. His, in, his invitation or non-invitation to appear on the show last week tonight. Um, Trump went on Twitter and claimed that uh, John Oliver's show had invited him five or six times to come on the program. And this was completely false. He, he'd never been invited. Uh, he denied knowing who white supremacist David Duke is. He called Ted Cruz an anchor baby. Um, Ted Cruz is, is a Canadian born to legal resident parents. He denied asking, another one of these weird, you know, denying, lying about nothing for no reason, denied asking for Megyn Kelly to be removed as GOP debate moderator when he's said it multiple times in writing. Uh, he claimed that the Mexican government is sending rapists to the U.S. And this wasn't just some weird slip of the tongue. Like, I initially thought, oh, he must have meant Me Mex Mexico is sending rapists. Rapists are coming from Mexico. But no, he doubled down on that. He actually insisted, no, this is a this is an actual plan by the government of Mexico to offload all their criminals and rapists on the United States. And his first campaign ad uh, tried to pass off footage of Morocco as footage of Mexico, showing uh, purported illegal immigrants flooding over some border. This is a uh, picture of the Twitter exchange here from Donald Trump. John Oliver and his people had to call and ask me to be on his very boring and low-rated show. I said, no thanks, waste of time and energy. And last week, tonight follows up, a couple of points. Yes, we have a boring show. Two, at no point did we invite Donald Trump to appear on it. And you can watch Don Oliver's um, Donald Trump segment on YouTube. I, I think it's hilarious that some of the best reporting on Donald Trump is, being, is done by a guy who vehemently denies being a journalist. I mean, how's that for our sort of post-factual <laughs> world? But uh, he had a great routine in which he said that, you know, Donald Trump's relationship to the truth is much like a lemur's relationship to the Supreme Court vacancy. <laughs> and here are some examples of, uh, strain, of uh, categories of Trump, oh, of outrageous things Donald Trump has said that it's unclear whether he really knows the truth value or not, and again, doesn't care. Um, he doesn't really have any, or until last week and when he hired a bunch of weirdos, didn't really have any foreign policy advisors. I'm speaking with myself on foreign policy, which explains a lot of the stuff he said. Um, $5 billion trade deficit with China is an interesting one. It's off by about 30%. And it's interesting because he said it three or four times since he was initially called out. Like, it's not the most egregious, but it's one of, it's one of the frequent flyers. Um, he has claimed that uh, the omnibus spending bill that funded ISIS that vaccine cause, causes autism. Uh, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. And this brings us to the wall, a study in bullshit. As you all know, the signature campaign promise of Donald Trump is building a physical wall across the southern border um, to supplant the $6 billion fence that we already have. Um, and of course, Donald Trump is saying that Mexico is going to have to pay for this wall as well. And just everything about this plan, it is such a perfect example of Frankfurtian bullshit because this is a truly impossible plan and Trump must at some level know it. Is that you couldn't come up with a more perfect example of someone saying something just to say it, just to be perceived as the kind of guy who would say it, to let his supporters come out in favor of it and be perceived as the kind of people who would be in favor of something like that. I mean, the, the wall is logistically, politically, and legally impossible. It would take 
10% of the total concrete consumption of the United States to build this thing. You'd have to melt down multiple battleships worth of steel. It would, the, the logistics of actually getting people to go into these remote locations to build it would be prohibitive. The, uh, Tristan Capps had an excellent piece in City Lab. He's, a, he's an architecture journalist about how it would be impossible to even find a respectable design firm that could take on the project because of all the exposure that would come with it. Um, a, st a structural engineer had a great analysis in the National Memo about the uh, preposterousness of uh, actually undertaking this project from an engineering level. And Trump's, the way Trump describes it makes it pretty clear that this is fantasy. Uh, his estimates of its projected length and height vary by the day, anywhere from 30 to 85 feet. It jumped 15 feet in a single evening on February 25th. Uh, when he got mad at the president of Mexico, uh, it jumped another 10 feet. He it, his, there's, it, there's nowhere on the, his campaign website that gives you any specifics. You just have to look back in LexisNexis and see the various things he said about how long, how long it's supposed to be, 2,000 miles versus 1,000 miles. Um, and Trump has never given a consistent estimate of how much this will cost. He said, he said somewhere between $4 billion, $10 billion more. The Washington Post's independent analysis said that it would cost $25 billion if it could be built at all. This is Kristen Capps' assessment in City, in City Lab. The wall proposal crumbles at even the slightest scrutiny. Nobody who can build it would, and nobody who would, no one who would build it can. And, and that's making Mexico pay is arguably even more ridiculous than the idea of building the wall. It's, and I, I want to give you that, it seems like some kind of weird email scam when you read the text on Donald Trump's website. The way he explains, like this loophole, it's not, where he, he thinks he's found it, that what they're gonna do is they're gonna get, they, you know that there's, this is actually true, about 23, million, billion, about $23 billion in remittances from people who are working in Mexico going back to their families in Mexico every year. Through the, that's what the Bank of Mexico's numbers say. And some of those are undocumented people and some of those are legal residents who are sending money back to their, back to their families. Probably about 50-50 because more undocumented people spend, send money, but uh, those who are documented tend to have more money to send, so it kind of evens out. But Donald Trump's idea is, well, what if we made it basically impossible for Mexicans to send money to their families or threaten to do that to make Mexico pay for the wall? Because then Mexico would cough up five or ten billion dollars in a day and everything would be fine. He literally says this, day one. Day two, day three, we take away the threat. But, and the threat is to use the Patriot Act to re require proof of status in order to wire money overseas. And as a, a major law firm pointed out on their website, they're an anti-money laundering uh, compliance blog, the key threat is already the law in terms of whether Western Union is considered a money services, um, a money services uh, business subject to, your know, to the know your customer laws. Uh, it, the implication is this is simply never enforced because it would bankrupt the Western Union. And as the Washington Post, um, Bob Woodward noticed, it sort of takes the sting out of the threat when you note that Bob Woodward, that um, Donald Trump also planned to deport, the promise to deport the 11 million people who were supposed to be sending this money in the first place. So it's unclear as to why Mexico would be really scared of anything Donald Trump might threaten to do with remittances. And I, I like the fact the Mexican president count now stands, stands at three against this plan. One current and two former who have come out to say that this will never ever happen. So I think a good acronym to, uh, to assess anything that Donald Trump says or does is what's in it for Trump or WIFT. <laughs> Trump's a developer, he knows the obstacles. So why is he saying this? Would he try if he were in power? Probably, but for now he's saying it for the sake of saying it. It's, it's useful to think of the wall as a brand. It, it, everything about the wall as a concept burnishes Trump's image as a strong leader, an iconoclast, a builder, and a businessman. He, he's always talking about the great wall, the greatest wall, an amazing wall, a beautiful wall. You can see him picturing himself in the company of you know, great wall builders like Ki Shi Huan, Hadrian, and Bran the Builder. And if you're going to say, well, Bran the Builder isn't real, he's just from Game of Thrones, you're clearly haven't been paying attention. <laughs> He's right here. Um, Trump's sincerity and bullshit. And it's probably the wrong question to ask as to whether Trump is sincere. Because, and Frankfurt warned us about this. He said, you know, in, in his, in his uh, observation that sincerity is bullshit. Because some of the worst bullshit in politics is caused by obsessing over authenticity and sincerity. 
that you've got you, people micro-examining micro all these annoying things, and truly manipulative people, true bullshitters, have learned to feign authenticity. <laughs> There's a saying in Hollywood, it's like, well, sincerity is everything. Once you can, can bake that, you've got it made. And, so, and what matters ultimately is getting it right, not seeming sincere. And the only way to really successfully counter Donald Trump's brand of bullshit is to simply relentlessly counter him on, on the fact-free nature of it. And I think also to mock him, because um, I think that satirists like John Oliver are really doing more than virtually anybody else because if his motive is self-aggrandizement, anything, any kind of satire that punctures the self-aggrandizement does more to strike at the root of why he's doing this than all the factual arguments in the world. And uh, this is a highways minister, uh, Flying Phil Gallardi. I wanted to include this quote because he was a big figure in the politics of British Columbia where I grew up and he was famous for saying, if I tell a lie, it's because I think I'm telling the truth. Or another version of that quote that's floating around is, I always think I'm telling the truth when I say it. And I'm going to close with a quote from Jeet here before we go to the Q&A. Jeet was the guy who started all this. His essay, Donald Trump is not a liar in the New Republic, was what inspired me to, to write this talk. And um, Jeet concludes by saying, in effect, Trump wants us to take us to a land where subjectivity is all and where reality is simply what he says. Thank you.